Hello friends, uh, today I'm hiking out to Lily Pond here at Carolina Beach State Park and I'm thinking about my great-great-grandfather. Uh, I'm a fourth generation pastor but my great-great-grandfather was not. Um, in fact, the only thing I know about the guy is that he was hiking through the woods one day, he got bit by a snake and he died. And I want you to keep that in mind today. His, his entire life was defined by a snake bite. So keep that in mind as you hear Numbers chapter 21 and John chapter 3. I invite you to listen to that now. Numbers 21. They traveled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go to Edom. But the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the desert? There is no bread. There is no water. And we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them, and they bit the people, and many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it on a pole. And then when anyone was bitten by a snake and looked at the bronze snake, he lived. John chapter 3. Just as Moses lifted the snake up in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Well, once again, God's people are in the wilderness and they're complaining. But this time their complaints are more childish, more nonsensical. They say, we have no food to eat and the food we eat is miserable. I'm sure Moses was like, but you just said, anyway. So God, instead of giving them water from a rock, instead of giving them manna, this time he actually gives them poisonous snakes. He's fed up. He wants to make a point. And people are bitten and people die. So much so that the people plead with Moses, please tell God to, to, to call off the snakes. And instead of calling off the snakes, what God does is this. He tells Moses to make a bronze snake and to hold it high so that people can see. And when people get bit, they can look at that bronze snake and be healed. It's a way of turning our torment and our pain and the things that we're scared of, it's a way of turning it inside out. And then in John chapter 3, Jesus is speaking with Nicodemus and he says something very similar. He says the Son of Man, just like Moses lifted up the bronze snake, the Son of Man will be lifted up too. He's speaking about the Savior on a cross, dying for the sins of the world. And he said when people see that, they will also be saved. <laughs> That's what God does. The, the snake bites represent our failings and our sins. The cross represents the the harshness and the challenge of the world that are pressed against us, the, the unfairness of the world. And God works to transform those things, to turn them inside out. What was once meant for our destruction is now our salvation. That's what God does. You may be familiar with the, uh, the story of Ray Hinton. He was a man who was uh, convicted of first degree murder in the 1980s. <clears throat> he was tried and convicted, and then he spent 28 years on death row. And the, the case against him was very flimsy. He passed the polygraph. He had an airtight alibi. Um, the ballistics and the gun didn't match. But in 2015, his conviction was overturned by the Supreme Court. And the first thing he said when he got out of prison was, the sun does come up. That was also the title of his memoir. And in his memoir, he tells a great story about a a fellow inmate, a guy in death row, who, who was about to be executed. He had committed a, a terrible crime, but the reason he said he committed that crime was because he had no one in his life to love him. I mean, think about what we would do if we had no one in our life to love us. And so he said right before he was executed, the cellmates had the idea, or the, the other guys in death row, they had the idea of making tons and tons of noise right before his execution as a sign that we love you and we're thinking about you. And it was said that when this man died, he was smiling because for the first time in his life, someone loved him. 
we're getting closer now. Uh, Kate Bowler, who's a professor at Duke Divinity School, she said that last Lent she made a point to travel to all of these mega churches in America. She said she went to the biggest one, the one in Lakewood, Texas. This, of course, is the church of uh, Pastor Joel Osteen. She said that when she went, she went on Good Friday, the most solemn service of the year. And when she went, she met a greeter there, first greeter at the door, and they said, Happy Good Friday. <laughs> And she kept moving inside, and she said there were seven greeters who all wished her a very happy Good Friday, a ha ha happiest Good Friday. And she said it's, it's great, you know, to get the good vibes going, but that's a, a misunderstanding of the cross. The cross was a, a symbol of torture and death. It wasn't a happy Good Friday. And she pointed to the words of Martin Luther, who said that everyone wants to dress the cross up in roses. But truly, you can't, you can't make it prettier. You can't make it more beautiful. We have to first look, before we do any of that, at the terrifying nature of the cross itself. It's a, a symbol of torment. Just the, the mention, the alluding to of a cross in the Bible would, would send a shiver down people's spines. You can't back away from that. Okay, I just saw a giant snake go by, just cross right in front of me. It's a little too poignant. <laughs> I gotta be careful. So the Cape Fear River is just right over there. Uh, a Jesuit priest, uh, Father Greg Boyle, uh, started a gang rehabilitation ministry in Los Angeles. Uh, this is the gang rehab. This is the gang capital of the world, and he, he's famous for saying that the best way to stop a bullet is a job. <laughs> and so that's his work: is to, to get these former gang members to, to be employed. And so he, he, he gives them jobs through this ministry. And he was talking about the, the struggles of them finding jobs out in the world. And he said, certainly their, their tattoos and their criminal records are a hindrance. But mostly, the greatest struggle to getting back to normal in their life, to rebuilding their life, is actually their snake bites and their crosses. He said, their past that haunts them, the grief they feel, the mistakes they made, he said a lot of them, they try to ignore it. They try to hopscotch around it, pretend like it never happened, but you can't do that. And that's what they teach them there. And they have you know, professional counselors there. They have volunteer counselors. He said they have over 50 volunteer counselors to help these gang members because it's so important to look at those wounds and to examine them and to move forward. He said, if you don't look at your wound, you're eventually gonna inflict it on others. He said, you have to make friends with your wounds and your snake bites. Because if you don't, it's going to cause yourself pain and others pain. And it's true. All right, we're getting closer. And we're about to pass Cypress Pond. Uh, you should be able to see it here right behind you when we pass by. Stanley Harawas said that the, the great wound of God is the torture and execution of Christ. As it would be for any of us. But he said that in God's creativity, God took this horrible symbol of his son's death and turn it into a beautiful symbol, a symbol of salvation. And that is how God's heart was healed. And so we remember today that it's been now a year since we got an email from the bishop and we had to shut down all in-person worship. This time last year, I was huddled in the prayer chapel trying to record a service on my cell phone set up on a choir stand with Pastor Curtis and Pastor Emily and Molly and Will and Jen. <laughs> And uh, it was only 20 minutes long, but here we are a year later. And the year to the day that we shut everything down, I got my first vaccination shot. And it hurts so good. <laughs> my arm does. But as I was there, I went into this big room with lots of people. And it was time for my shot. And then I realized that the shirt I was wearing meant that they couldn't you know, access the top of my arm here. And so I had to take it off. I was wearing an undershirt, but it still felt a little awkward taking your shirt off in front of a, a room full of people. I remember thinking, I hope there are no parishioners here to see me take off my shirt. So I stand up, I take off my shirt, and then <laughs> immediately I get a text on my phone, and it's from a parishioner, and it says, I'm sitting right behind you. <laughs> of course. But it was great to see this person. I hadn't seen him in a year. It was great to laugh. We wanted to hug. We, we, we couldn't yet, but... That's what it's going to be. The wounds of our soul from this pandemic are going to be healed slowly but surely through laughter, through reunion. That is where we're heading. The wounds of this pandemic will, 
will finally begin to heal. And I'm reminded of the the words I don't I don't know who said it, but they said that through love, through love, all pain will become like medicine. Through love, all pain will become like medicine. What are your open wounds? What are the places in your life that need healing? Don't run from those places. Christ says, walk toward them because the grace of our Lord can slowly begin to heal those wounds so that you don't inflict them on yourself and on others. Trust God and these wounds will be healed. Well, there are no lily pads out. It's still a little early for that. It's still technically winter. I should have saw that coming. But like a lot of things in life, it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. Blessings to you this week. When peace like a river attendeth my way When sorrow Isn't it?